Uh, welcome to the admissions grand room um, and to the Alan K. Smith reading series. Uh, my name is Ethan Rutherford. For the two people in here, uh, I don't know. Um, and I teach creative writing here at Trinity, and it's my great pleasure today to welcome um, Kelly Link to campus to read from her work. Um, so if you could please take a second to turn off your cell phones. Great. You also don't think that you have to say that, but then the last reading, someone was like talking to Siri. And we're like, it's unacceptable. So sort of like a little catapult where you're just like, you're gone. Um, so, yeah, it's like we feed you and you take phone calls. It's unbelievable. Um, so Kelly Link uh, has been called a national treasure by Neil Gaiman. And her strange and terrifying and complicated and wonderful short stories have been published in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, the best American short stories, uh, the o. Henry, o. Henry Prize stories, and she has co-edited a number of anthologies, including multiple volumes of the year's best fantasy and horror. She co-founded Small Beard Press and co-edited the occasional zine, Lady Churchill's Rosebud Wristlet. Um, and she's the author of four story collections, the most recent of which, Get in Trouble, which this is what it looks like. We have copies in the back. I'm sure Kelly would be happy to sign copies of her work afterwards. Um, uh, this book, Get in Trouble, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, which should make any heart sing, uh, but I think it has a particular resonance for short story writers, who may perhaps possess the darkest hearts around. Um, you wonder, when a, sh when a short story's collection is named as one of Time Magazine's 10 best books of the year, if perhaps you've woken up in a strange pocket universe, uh, where all is right and just, and the sun always shines, and amazing books get the credit that they're due. Uh, and then you realize that, that the only reason you think in terms of pocket universes, uh, where people have two shadows, uh, where mermaids are an invasive species, where a spaceship becomes a haunted house, and where ghosts walk, is because you've read Kelly Link. And your sense of how the world operates, or could operate, has been put on permanent slant. That's how these stories work on me, at least. Um, and I read Kelly Link when I want to remember what it's like to be open to the strangeness of the world. The stories should be fun, and they should take root, and they should deposit you, slightly dazed uh, and infused with new language uh, at the foot of something that is both mysterious and recognizable. Um, these are terrific stories. Uh, they're like nothing you've read before, uh, and I'm so glad they exist. Uh, so Kelly Link lives in Northampton, Massachusetts, and it's our great pleasure to have her here to read tonight. So please join me in welcoming Kelly Link. <clears throat> I feel that we're practically neighbors. It's such an easy trip down here. Um, and I will answer any questions you guys have after I read. Um, but I never like asking questions when I go to readings. So if you don't ask questions, but you have a question, you can find me on Twitter. And I actually really like Twitter for answering questions. And um, I'm going to read from a story called I Can See Right Through You. And we'll see time-wise how we do. When the sex tape happened and things went south with Fawn, the demon lover did what he always did. He went to cry on Maggie's shoulder. Girls like Fawn came and went, but Maggie would always be there. Him and Maggie, it was the talisman you kept in your pocket, the one you couldn't lose. Two monsters can kiss in a movie. One old friend can go to see another old friend and be sure of his welcome. So here's the demon lover in a rental car. An hour into the drive, he opens the window of the rental car, tosses out his cell phone. There is no one he wants to talk to except for Maggie. 1991. This is after the movie and after they are together and after they begin to understand the bargain that they have made, they are both suddenly very famous. Film can be put together in any order, scenes shot in any order of sequence, take as many takes as you like. Continuity is independent of linear time. Sometimes you aren't even in the scene together. Maggie says her lines to your stand-in. They'll splice you together later on. This is long before any of that. This was a very long time ago. Maggie tells the demon lover a story. Two girls, and look, they found a Ouija board. They make a list of questions. 
One girl is pretty, one girl is not really a part of this story. She's lost her favorite sweater. Two girls each touching lightly the planchette. Is anyone here? Where did I put my blue sweater? Will anyone ever love me? Things like that. They ask their questions, the planchette drifts, they start the list over again. Is anyone here? Will I be famous? Where is my blue sweater? The planchette jerks under their fingers. M, E, Maggie says, did you do that? The other girl says she didn't. M, E, G, Maggie. It's talking to you, the other girl says. M, E, G, Maggie, hello. Maggie says, hello? The planchette moves. There's something animal about it. H E L H E L L O hello I am with you I am with you always They write it all down M E G Maggie O I will love you always Who is this she says who are you I S E I C U A pause then I W I L I will Maggie, oh, I will be with you always. Are you doing this? Maggie says to the other girl. She shakes her head. M, E, G, Maggie, wait. The other girl says, I just want to know where my sweater is. <laughs> o, W, A, O, wait, and I will come. They wait. Will there be a knock at the bedroom door, but no one comes, no one is coming? I am, I am with you always. No one is here with them. The sweater will never be found. The other girl grows up, lives a long and happy life. Maggie goes out to L.A. and meets the demon lover. Is there a great insight here? <laughs> W-A-I-T. After that, the only thing the planchette says over and over is Maggie's name. It's all very romantic. <laughs> 1974, 22 people disappear from a nudist colony in Lake Apopka. People disappear all the time, let's be honest. The only thing interesting here is that these people were naked and that no one ever saw them again. Funny, right? 1990, it's one of the 10 most iconic movie kisses of all time. In the top five, surely you and Maggie, the demon lover, and his monster girl, vampire sharing a kiss as the sun comes up, both of you wearing so much makeup it still astonishes you that anyone would ever recognize you on the street. It's hard for the demon lover to grow old. Florida is California on a trauma budget. That's what the demon lover thinks anyway. Special effects blew the budget on bugs and bad weather. He parks in a meadowy space recently mowed alongside other rental cars, the usual catering and equipment vans. There are two gate posts with a chain between them. No offense, eternal I endure. There's an evil smell. Does it belong to the place or to him? The demon lover sniffs under his arm. It's an end of the world sky, a snakes and ladders landscape, low emerald trees pulled lower by vines, chalk and apricot anthills. The demon lover imagines the bones of a nudist under every one. Shallow water-filled declivities scummed with algae, lime, and gold, and black. The blood of the lake, that's another theory, the lake. A storm is coming. He doesn't get out of his car. He rolls the window down and watches the storm come in. Let's look at him, looking at it, a pretty thing admiring a pretty thing. Abandoned sight of a mass disappearance, muddy violet clouds, silver veils of rain, driving down the lake, the tabloid prince of darkness, Maggie's demon lover, arriving in all his splendor. The only thing to spoil it are the bugs and the sex tape. 2012, you have been famous for more than half of your life, both of you. You only made the one movie together, but people still stop you on the street to ask about Maggie. Is she happy? Sometimes they don't ask about Maggie. Sometimes they will ask if you will bite them. <laughs> Happiness, misery. If you were one, bet on it, the other was on the way. That was what everybody liked to see. It was what the whole thing was about. The demon lover has a pair of gold cufflinks, those faces. Maggie gave them to him. You know the ones I mean. 2010, Maggie and the demon lover throw a Halloween party for everyone they know. They do this every Halloween. They're famous for it. Year after year, on a monkey's face, a monkey's face, Maggie says. 
She's King Kong. The year before, half a pantomime horse. He's the demon lover. Who else, year after year? Maggie says, I've decided to give up acting. I'm going to be a poet. Nobody cares when poets get old. Fawn says, appraisingly, I hope I look half as good as you when I'm your age. Fawn, 23, a makeup artist. This year, she and the demon lover are married. Last year, they met on set. He says, I'm thinking I could get some work done in my jawline. You'd think they were mother and daughter, same Viking profile, same quizzical tilt to the head as they turned to look at him, both taller than him, both smarter too, no doubt about it. Maybe Maggie wonders sometimes about the woman he sleeps with, marries, maybe he has a type, but so does she. There's a guy at the Halloween party, a boy really. Maggie always has a boy and the demon lover can always pick him out, easy enough even if Maggie's sly. She never introduces the lover of the moment, never even acknowledges their presence. They hang out on the edge of whatever is happening and drink or smoke or drink or smoke or watch Maggie at the center. Sometimes they drift closer, stand near enough to Maggie that it's plain what's going on. When she leaves, they follow after. Maggie's type. The funny thing is, Maggie's lovers all look like the demon lover. More like the demon lover, he admits it, than he does. He and Maggie are both older now, but the world is full of beautiful black haired boys and golden girls. Really, that's the problem. The role of the demon lover comes with certain obligations. Your hairline will not recede, your waistline will not expand, you are not to be photographed threatening paparazzi or in sweatpants. No sex tapes. Your fans will offer their necks at premieres, also at restaurants and at the bank, more than once when he is standing in front of a urinal. Ask if you will bite their wives, their daughters, they will cut themselves with a razor in front of you. The appropriate reaction is, there is no appropriate reaction. The demon lover does not always live up to his obligations. There is a sex tape, there's a girl with a piercing, there is in the middle of some athletic sex a comical incident involving his foreskin. There's blood all over the sheets, there's a lot of blood. There's a 911 call, there's him fainting, falling and hitting his head on a bedside table. There's Perez, Helton, Gawker, talk radio, YouTube, Tumblr, there are gifts. You will always be most famous for playing the lead in a series of vampire movies. The character you play is, of course, ageless, but you get older. The first time you bite a girl's neck, Maggie's neck, you're a 25-year-old actor playing a vampire who hasn't gotten a day older in 300 years. Now you're a 49-year-old actor playing the same ageless vampire. It's getting to be a little ridiculous, isn't it? But if the demon lover isn't the demon lover, then who is he? Who are you? Other projects disappoint. Your agent says, Take a comic role. The trouble is, you're not very funny. You're not good at funny. The other trouble is the sex tapes. Sex tapes are inherently funny. Nudity is regrettably funny. Torn foreskins are painfully funny. You didn't know she was filming it. Your agent says, that wasn't what I meant. When the sex tape happens, you say to Fawn, but what does this have to do with Meggie? This has nothing to do with Meggie. It was just some girl. It's not like there haven't been other girls. Fawn says, it has everything to do with Meggie. I can see right through you, Fawn says, less in sorrow than in anger. She probably can. And hasn't it been in the back of your mind all this time? It was Meggie right at the start. Why shouldn't it be Meggie again? And in the meantime, you could get married once in a while and never worry about whether or not it worked out. He and Meggie have managed all this time to stay friends. His marriages, his other relationships, perhaps these have only been a series of delaying actions, small rebellions. And here's the thing about his marriages, he's never managed to stay friends with his ex-wives, his exes. He and Fawn won't be friends. The demon lover and Meggie have known each other for such a long time. No one knows him like Meggie. The remains of the nudist colony at Lake Apopka promise reasonable value for ghost hunters. A dozen ruined cabins, some roofless, windows black with mildew, a crumbled stucco hall, Spanish tiles receding, the cracked lip of a slop-filled pool. Between the cabins and the lake, the homely and welcome sight of half a dozen trailers, even better, he spots a craft tent. Muck farms, mutant alligators, disappearing nudists, the demon lover killing time in the LAX airport, read up on Lake Apopka. The past is a weird place, Florida is a weird place, no news there. A demon lover should fit right in, but the ground sucks and clots in his shoes in a way that suggests he isn't welcome. The rain is directly overhead now, spouting down and shouting down in spitworm gouts. He begins to run, stumbling in the direction of the craft tent. 
Maggie's career is on the upswing. Everyone agrees she has a ghost hunting show. Who's there? Admit that who's there is entertaining whether or not you believe in ghosts. It's all about the nasty detail, the house that gives you a bad feeling even when you turn on all the lights, the awful thing that happened to someone who wasn't you a very long time ago. Maggie sells you on the possibility maybe what's going on here is real. Maybe someone is out there. Maybe they have something to say. The demon lover can talk to Maggie about anything. It's been that way all along. They haven't talked since the sex tape. Better to have this conversation in person. 1991, he and Maggie are lovers. Their movie is big at the box office. Everywhere they go, they are famous, and they go everywhere. Their faces are everywhere. They are kissing on a thousand screens. They are in a hotel room kissing. They can't leave their hotel room without someone screaming or feigning or pointing something at them. They are asked the same questions over and over again. There's a night on some continent in some city, some hotel room, some warm night. The demon lover and Maggie leave a window open and two women creep in. They come over the balcony. They just want to tell you that they love you, both of you. They just want to be near you. When people disappear, there's always the chance that you'll see them again. The rain comes down so hard the demon lover can barely see. He thinks he is still moving in the direction of the craft tent and not the lake. There's a noise. He picks it out of the noise of the rain, a howling. And then the rain thins and he can see something, men and women, naked, running toward him. He slips, catches himself, and the rain comes down hard again, erases everything except the sound of what is chasing him. He collides headlong with a thing, a skin horribly clammy, cold, somehow both stiff and yielding, bounces off and realizes that this is the tent. Not where you'd choose to make a last stand, but by the time he has fumbled his way inside the flap, he has grasped the situation. Not dead nudists, but living people, naked, cursing, laughing, dripping. They carry cameras, mics, gear for ghost hunting, videographers, A2s, all the other useful types and the not so useful. A crowd of men and women, and here is Maggie. Her hair is glued in strings to her face. Her breasts are wet with rain. He says her name. They all look at him. How is it possible that he is the one who feels naked? The fuck is this guy doing here, says someone with a little white towel positioned over his genitals. Really, it could be even littler. Well, Maggie says, so gently, he almost starts to cry. Well, it's been a long day. She takes him to her trailer. He has a shower, borrows her toothbrush. She puts on a robe, doesn't ask any questions, talks to him while he's in the bathroom. He leaves the door open. It's the third day on location. The first two have been a mixed bag. They got their establishing shots, went out on the lake, and saw an alligator dive down when they got too close. There are baby skunks all over the scrubby, shabby woods, the trails. They come right up to you, up to the camera, and try like hell to spray. But until they hit adolescence, all they can do is quiver their tails and stamp their feet. Except, she says, and mentions some poor A2, his skunk was an early bloomer. Maggie interviewed the former proprietor of the nudist colony, a harmless old crank. Whatever happened, he had nothing to do with it. You couldn't lecture people into thin air. Besides, he had an alibi. What they didn't, didn't get on the first day or even on the second day was any kind of worthwhile read on their equipment. They have the two psychics, but one of them had an emergency, went back to deal with a daughter in rehab. They have all kinds of psychometric equipment, but there's absolutely nothing going down on or off, which led to some discussion. We decided maybe we were the problem, Maggie says. Maybe the nudists didn't have anything to say to us while we had our clothes on, so we're shooting in the nude. Everyone nude, cast, crew, everyone. It's been a really positive experience, Well, It's a really good group of people. Fun, the demon lover says. Someone has dropped off a pair of pink cargo shorts and a t-shirt because his clothes are in his suitcase back at the airport in Orlando. It's not exactly that he forgot, more like he couldn't be bothered. It's good to see you, Will, Maggie says, but why are you here exactly? How did you know we were here? He takes the easy question first, Pike. Pike is Maggie's agent and an old friend of the demon lover. He flaps down on the floor in front of Maggie's chair. She runs her fingers through his hair, pets him the way you'd pet a dog. He told you I was coming. He did, Maggie says, he called. The demon lover says, Maggie, this isn't about the sex tape. Maggie says, I know, Vaughn called too. She wanted me to let her know if you showed, said she was waiting to see before she threw in the towel. She waits for him to say something. 
waits a little bit longer, strokes his hair the whole time. I don't love her, the demon lover says. Well, Maggie says, she takes that hand away. There's a knock on the door, some girl. Sun's out again, Maggie. She gives the demon lover a particularly melting smile, was probably 12 when she first saw him on screen. Baby ducks these girls, imprint on the first vampire they ever see. <laughs> then she's down the stairs again, bare bottom bouncing. Maggie drops the robe, begins to apply sunblock to her arms and face. He notes the ways in which her body has changed, thinks he might love her all the more for it, and hopes that this is true. She says, you must be tired, take a nap. There's herbal tea in the cupboards, pot and ambient in the bedroom. We're shooting all afternoon, straight through to evening. And then a barbecue, we're filming that too. You're welcome to come out. It would be great publicity for us, of course. Our viewers would love it. But you'd have to do it naked like the rest of us, no clothes. No exceptions, Well, not even for you. I love you, Maggie, he says. You know that, right? I know. I love you too, Well, she says. The way she says it tells him everything. When the demon lover wakes up, he takes off the t-shirt and cargo shorts, leaves them folded neatly on the bed. Day is becoming night. Meat is cooking on a barbecue. The demon lover isn't sure when he last ate. There's a bug spray beside the door, ticklish on his balls. He feels just a little bit ridiculous. Surely, this is a terrible idea, the latest in a long series of terrible ideas. Only this time he knows there's a camera. The moment he steps outside Maggie's trailer, a PA appears as if by magic, it's what they do. Has him sign a pile of releases. Odd to stand here in the nude signing releases, but what the fuck, he thinks, I'll go home tomorrow. The PA is in her 50s, unusual. There's probably a story there, but who cares? He doesn't. Of course she's seen the fucking sex tape. It's probably going to be the most popular movie he ever makes. But her expression suggests this is the very first time she's ever seen the demon lover naked, or rather neither of them is naked at all. While the demon lover signs, doesn't bother to read anything, what does it matter now anyway, the PA talks about someone who hasn't done something, who isn't where she ought to be. Some other gopher named Juliet, where is she and what has she gone for? The PA is full of complaints. The demon lover suggests the gopher may have been carried off by ghosts. The PA gives him an unfriendly look and continues to talk about people the demon lover doesn't know, has no interest in. What's spooky about you, the demon lover asks, because of course, that's the show's gimmick, producer down to best boy, every woman and man uncanny. I had a near death experience, the PA says. She wiggles her arm, shows off a long ropey burn, accidentally electrocuted myself, got the whole tunnel and light thing. So tell me, the demon lover says, what's so fucking great about a tunnel and a light? That really the best they can do? Yeah, well, the PA says, a bite in her voice. People like you probably get the red carpet in the limo. The demon lover has nothing to say to them. You seen anything here? He tries and said, heard anything? Maggie tell you about the skunks, the PA says, having snapped, now she will soothe. Those babies, tails up the works, but nothing doing. Which about sums up this place, no ghosts, no read on the equipment, no hanky-panky, fiddle-faddle, or woo-woo, not even a cult spot. She says, doubtfully, but it'll come together. You at the seance, barbecue shindig will help. Naked vampire trumps nudist ghosts any day. Okay on your own? You go on down to the lake, I'll call, let them know you're on the way. Thanks, the demon lover says. And here's another someone. It's a regular Pilgrim's Progress. This is a kid in his 20s, good looking in a familiar way. Although, is it okay to think this about another guy when you're both naked, not to mention who looks a lot like you did once upon a time? Why not, we're all naked here. I know you, the kid says. The demon lover says, of course you do. You are? Ray, says the kid. He's maybe 25. His look says, you know who I am. Mikey's told me all about you. As if he doesn't already know, the demon lover says, so what do you do? The kid scratches at his groin luxuriously, maybe not on purpose. Whatever needs to be done, that's what I do. So he deals. There's that pot in Mikey's dresser. Down at the lake, people are playing volleyball in a pit with no net, barbecuing. Someone talks to a camera, gestures at someone else, someone somewhere smoking a joint. 
At this distance, not too close, not too near, twilight coming down, the demon lover takes in all the breasts, asses, comical cocks, knobby knees, everything hidden, now made plain. He notes with an experienced eye which breasts are real, which aren't. Only a few of the women sport pubic hair. He's never understood what that's about. Some of the men are bare too. O tempora omores. You like jokes? Ray says, stopping to light a cigarette. The demon lover could leave, he lingers. Depends on the joke. Really, he doesn't, especially the kind of jokes the ones who ask if you like jokes tell. Ray says, you like this one. So there are these four guys, a kleptomaniac, a pyromaniac, um, a zoophile, and a masochist. This cat walks by and the klepto says he'd like to steal it. The pyro says he wants to set it on fire. The zoophilic wants to fuck it. So the masochist, he looks at everybody and he says, meow. It's a moderately funny joke. It might be a come on. The demon lover flicks a look from under his lashes, suppresses the not quite queasy feeling he's somehow traveled back in time to flirt with himself or the other way around. He'd like to think he was even prettier than this kid. People used to stop and stare when he walked into a room. That was long before anyone knew who he was. He's always been someone you look at longer than you should. He says, smiling, I'll bite. Which one are you? Pardon? Ray says, blow smoke. Which one are you? The klepto, the pyro, the catfucker, the masochist? I'm the guy who tells the joke, Ray says. He drops the cigarette, grinds it under a heel, black with dirt, lights another. Don't know if anyone's told you, but don't drink out of the taps or go swimming. The water's toxic, phosphorus, other stuff. They shut down the muck farms. They're building up the marshlands again, but it's still not what I'd call potable. You staying out here or in town? The demon lover says, don't know if I'm staying at all. Well, Ray says, they've rigged up some of the less wrecked bungalows on a generator. There are camp beds, sleeping bags. Depends on whether you like it rough. That last with, yes, a leer. The demon lover feels his own lip lifting. They are both wearing masks. They look out of them at each other. This is what you knew when you were an actor. The face, the whole body, the way you moved in it, just the guys. You put it on, you put it off again. What was underneath belonged to you, just you as long as you kept it hidden. He says, you think you know something about me? I've seen all your movies, Ray says. The mask shifts, becomes the one the demon lover calls, I'm your biggest fan. Oh, he knows what's under that one. He prepares himself for whatever the strange kid is going to say next, and then suddenly Maggie is there, as if things weren't awkward enough, without Maggie, naked, suddenly standing there, everybody naked, Nobody happy at Scandinavian art porn. Maggie ignores the kid entirely, just like always. These guys are interchangeable, really. There's probably some website where she finds them. She may not want him, but she doesn't want anyone else either. Maggie says, touching his arm, you look a lot better. I got a few hours, he says. I know, she says, I checked in on you, wanted to make sure you hadn't run off. Where to go, he says. Come on, Maggie says, let's get you something to eat. Ray doesn't follow lingers with his cigarette, probably staring at their yoga-toned, well-enough-preserved celebrity butts. Here's the problem with this kid, the demon lover thinks. He sat in a theater when he was 15 and watched me and Meggie, done up in vampire makeup, pretend fucking on a New York subway car, the A-train. Me biting Meggie's breast, some suburban movie screen, her breast ten times bigger than his head. He probably masturbated a hundred times watching me bite you, Meggie. He watched us kiss. Felt something ache when we did. And that leaves out all the rest of this, whatever it is that you're doing here with him and me. Imagine what this kid must feel now. The demon lover feels it too. Love, he thinks. Because love isn't just love, it's all the other stuff too. He meets Irene, the medium who plays the straight man to Maggie, people named Sidra Tom Ewan, who seemed to be in charge of the weird ghost gear. A videographer, Pilar, he's almost positive he's met her before, maybe during his AA period. Really, why is that period more of a blur than the years he spent drunk or high? She's in her 30s, has a sly smile, terrific legs, and a very big camera. They demonstrate some of the equipment for the demon lover, let him try out something called a tri-field meter. No ghosts here. Even ghosts have better places to be. He assumes everyone he meets has seen his sex tape, almost wishes someone would mention it. No one does. There's a rank breeze off the lake, muck, and death. 
People eat and discuss the missing PA, the gopher, some Juliet person. Maggie says, she's a nice kid, makes horigami in her spare time and sells it on eBay. She makes what? The demon lover says, horigami, origami porn tableau, custom order stuff. Of course, the demon lover says, big money in the... She may have some kind of habit. Maggie mentions this. She may be in the habit of disappearing now and then. Or she may be wherever all those nudists went. Imagine the ratings then. He doesn't say this to Maggie. Maggie says, I'm happy to see you well, even under the circumstances. Are you? Says the demon lover, smiling. Because he's always smiling. They're far away from the mics and the cameras. Pilar, the videographer, is recording Irene, the medium, who is toasting marshmallows. Ray is watching, too is always somewhere nearby. Something bites the demon lover's thigh and he slaps at it. Of course I'm happy, Maggie says, and your timing is eerily good because I have something to talk to you about. Shoot, he says. How about later, after we're done here, she says. It's almost full dark now, no moon. Someone has built up a very large fire. The blackened bungalows in the roofless hall arc into obscure and tidy shapes. Now you can imagine yourself back when it was all new a long time ago, back in the 70s, when nobody cared what you did, when love was free, when you could just disappear if you felt like it, and that was fine and good too. So where do I stay tonight, the demon lover says, again fights the impulse to touch Maggie's face. There's a strand of hair against her lip. Which is he, the pyromaniac or the masochist? Well, he's an actor, isn't he? He can be anything she wants him to be. I'm sure you'll find somewhere, Maggie says, a glint in her eye, or someone. Pilar has told me more than once that you're the only man she's ever wanted to fuck. If I had a dollar, the demon lover says. He still wants to touch her, wants her to want him to touch her. He remembers now how this goes. Maggie says, if you had a dollar, 70 cents would go to your exes. He says, on sign a prenup. One of the thousand reasons you should go home and fix things, Maggie says, she's a good person. She's better off without me, the demon lover says, trying it out. He's a little hurt when Maggie doesn't disagree. Irene, the medium, comes over with Pilar and the other videographer. The demon lover can tell Irene doesn't like him. Sometimes women don't like him, rare enough that he always wonders why. Shall we get started? Irene says, let's see if any of our friends are up for a quick chat. Maggie addresses the video camera next. This will be our final attempt, she says, our last chance to contact anyone who is still lingering here who has unfinished business. You'd think Nidus wouldn't be so shy, Irene says. Maggie says, but even if we don't reach anyone, today hasn't been a total loss. All of us have taken a risk. Some of us are sunburned. Some of us have bug bites in interesting places. All of us are a little more comfortable in our own skin. We've experienced openness and humanity in a way that these colonists imagined and hoped would lead to a better world. And maybe for them it did. We've had a good day, and even if the particular souls we came here in search of didn't show up, someone else is here. The A2 nods, it will. Pilar points the camera at him. He's been thinking about how to play this. I'm Will Gauld, he says. You probably recognize me from previous naked film roles, such as the guy rolling around on a hotel floor, clutching his genitals and bleeding profusely. I just happened to be in the area. We've hidden his clothes, Maggie says. Irene says, Maggie, one of the things that's been most important about who's there right from the beginning is that we've all had something happen to us that we can't explain away. We're all believers. I've been meaning to ask, does Will here have a ghost story? I don't. Will says, then pauses, looks at Maggie. I do, he says. But surely Maggie's already told it. I have, Maggie says. But I've never heard you tell it. Oh, there's stories the demon lover could tell. He says, I'm here to please. All around them, people have been clearing away plates of half-eaten barbecue, assembling in a half circle around the campfire. Any minute now, they'll be singing Kumbaya. They sit on their little towels. Irene and Maggie take their place in front of the fire. They clasp hands. The demon lover moves a little farther away into darkness. He's not interested in seances or ghosts. Here is the line of the shore, sharp things underfoot. Someone joins him, Ray, of course. It is worse somehow to be naked in the dark. The world is so big and he is not. Ray is young and he is not. He is pretty sure that the videographer Pilar will sleep with him. Maggie will not. I know you. 
the demon lover says to Ray, I've met you before. Well, not you, the previous you. You never last. We never last. She moves on. You disappear. Ray says nothing, looks out at the lake. I was you, the demon lover says. Ray says, and now, who are you? You charge by the hour, the demon lover says. I don't seem to have my wallet on me. Maggie's busy, Ray says, and I'm curious about you, what you think you're doing here. I came from Maggie, the demon lover says. We're friends. An old friend can come to see an old friend. Some other time I'll see her again, and you won't be around. I'll always be around. But you, you're just some guy who got lucky because you look like me. Ray says, I love her. Sucks, doesn't it? The demon lover says. He goes back to the fire and the naked people waiting for other naked people. Thinks about the story he is meant to tell. And I think I'm actually going to stop there. That's still maybe a third of the story to go. Lots of ghosts. Um, but thank you very much. And I, um, well, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. So I, I can, uh, I'm happy to talk about uh, stories um, because I run a small press with my husband. If you guys have questions about publishing, you can ask me those. Um, or you can ask me about magazine markets, things like that. Um, whatever you like. Yeah. I really like short stories. It's one of my favorite things to read. Uh, and I think also that uh, my focus is better over a short period of time. <laughs> um, having said that, uh, the stories in this collection got longer. Kind of a classic short story length is between 4,000 words, 6,000 words, and these stories are all 10,000 words or a little bit more. And so I. Um, when I sold this collection, I also sold a novel because uh, a good friend of mine, who was also a writer, um, said, well, you're going to write a novel by accident, so you might as well do it on purpose. And it seemed like good advice. Um, so now I have to write one. And I should say, um, I, up in Northampton, uh, there are two young adult writers, Holly Black and Cassandra Clare. And we all work together. We all meet up in coffee houses or in, people, in each other's houses and sit and write together, um, which I know that in general, if you think about writers, you think that they're supposed to work on their own. And I've tried that, and I will do almost anything else besides write. But if other people around me are also writing, then I find it a lot easier to work. And they work really hard. Other questions? Yeah. How do you come up with your um, you know, uh, I went to a, a literary festival where the theme was short stories, and uh, one of the features of the festival was that you sit and you listen to everybody else's, all the other writers when they read or, or give uh, presentations or are in panels. And I was really taken aback because everybody, when they talked about how they wrote things, uh, said they started at the beginning. and. Um, when I start a story, I always know what I want the ending to be. And so getting the beginning right is tricky because I feel as if I'm having to set up everything that will lead to the ending that I want. Um, but the ending may change a little bit, but typically it's very similar to the idea that I had when I started. It's almost always the end that's the starting place for the story. Having said that, my endings are not very tidy. Um, they're, they might also, I guess, they might also be sort of like beginnings mm -hmm. in the sense that I, my hope is that when you read them and you get to the end, it will occur to you that many things may be about to happen past that point. But hopefully I've, I've set it up enough that you have some idea about the people in the story and what they might do next. Yeah. Do you make up most of the short stories you write or do you get them from past life experiences? Mm -hmm. Uh, very rarely my own life. Um, sometimes there are things in the story um, that come from stories that my friends have told me. For, um, 
for example, my sister years ago told me a story about a friend who went to a wedding, stayed in a B&B, and uh, the first night that she was in the B&B, which was full of antiques, there were a lot of noises, but she didn't see anything. Second night that she was staying there, there were a lot of noises, and so finally she turned on the light, and there was a taxidermied animal, and beetles were just sort of flooding out of it. And I said to her, what did she do? And I said, I don't know what she did. <laughs> and she told me that. Um, so for years, I thought about that story. And I thought, at some point, when I have the right story to put it into, then I'll, I'll use that. And so there's a story in this collection where I thought, oh, this is a story where I get to use, I get to use that. Um, and you know, sometimes a friend will, will have had, I had a friend who uh, at lunch one time told me that that's really weird. The last seven people that I've gone out with have all been cellists. And so I save that up and use that for a story. But when I do that, I, I, do, try and ask, I do try and ask the people, say, I was thinking I would use that detail in a story. Is that OK with you? And so far, people have said yes. So yeah. Who are some of the short stories you admire? Mm. Um, well, I grew up really liking ghost stories. Uh, so people like M. R. James or Robert Aikman, um, Joan Aiken, who is uh, more famous for books like The Wolves of Willoughby Chase, but also wrote a lot of ghost stories. Um, but I also really, really like um, Grace Paley um, and Ursula Le Guin. And so uh, I just, I, mostly I just really like short stories. Yeah. Um, so, revision, um, when I start writing a story, you know, I'll get sort of a sentence or two in and then think, no, that's wrong. And I go back to the start of the story and I revise until I think that's a little better. And now I can keep on going. And so I do that and then I'll hit a couple of sentences down and think, no, oh, that's not great. So I'll go back to the beginning again. And I'll revise until I get where I left off. And then every day when I uh, come back to the work where I left it, I don't start where I left off. I just go to the beginning and start revising until I get to the point where I have no new stuff. And I, then I think, oh, I have to write something new now. And then when I get stuck, I think, oh, thank God, and I go back to the beginning. <laughs> and um, I don't actually write, I don't like writing a ton. Um, but in the same, I don't know, there are certain, uh, what I think of as habitual activities that you don't find pleasurable, but which are satisfying, like video games. Um, you know, if I play a game on my phone, I don't know that I'm enjoying it anymore, but there's a certain kind of satisfaction in completing a level, or in sort of getting past the point that I haven't gotten. And writing feels a lot the same way. I think here's something that I'm gonna spend some time doing. That's not fun, but I will feel better when I get something on the page that, that, that works. I, revising is, is the best part of writing, yeah. So would you say that writing is a passion of yours? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say I'm constantly in a fight with writing. Uh, I don't know, I, I, I'm not entirely, I, I'm passionate about reading. Uh, I used to work in a bookstore and I was super enthused about selling people books that I liked that I thought that they might like. Uh, and I don't particularly want to do anything else besides write, but um, I would not say that it is a love affair. It's, it's, more like a, it's more like a really long argument that I'm having with my laptop. Yeah. Uh, do ideas for stories come to you naturally, or do you have to like, think, sit down and like, think about them? They used to not, uh, it, I used to have to sort of dredge them up and it seemed very painful. But uh, there's a writer I know who taught for a long time and we actually published a book that she wrote about workshopping and one of her ideas ended up seeing very useful to me. It was that um, it's part of your brain that you are in communication with, um, which she calls the silent partner or Bob, and um, who provides you with, it sort of generates things for you. and when you when your response to things that this partner is generating are no, I don't like that, that sucks or that's terrible, 
uh, the partner part of your brain begins to shut down and produce less. But if you say to the partner, um, that's a great idea, when you have a good one, or I really like that, please give me more like that, that it sort of opens more and begins to produce more ideas. And I think that's actually true, that the more um, enthusiastic I can make myself be about stuff that is actually useful, the more of the useful stuff I get. But, you know, I also get most of that from working with two other writers or more sometimes and all just sitting around and talking about the things that we like in stories and about why we think that those things work. And I find that that generates a lot of ideas about structure. Other questions? Maybe one more? Yeah. Um, well, we all usually meet up around uh, 12 or 1 um, and just sit and work. Sometimes we do what we call sprints, where you, uh, you don't talk at all, you work for 30 minutes or half uh, to an hour, and then you stop and you all talk about what you've done. Um, and I will do that until uh, 5 or 6 if I don't have to pick my daughter up, and then I go home. Um, and once I have a story that is really moving along, then I will work on it just sort of continuously whenever I can. Um, but in the morning, I just mostly read the paper online. Um, and I'll tell a ghost story if we have time. Yeah, please tell a ghost story. Uh, so I've been, I've been collecting uh, ghost stories for the last couple of years. Um, and this is still the scariest one I know. Uh, this was somebody told this at a dinner party. She said that when she was a kid and lived in a small town in Texas, she had a recurring dream. She would be walking down the street of her town in one direction and a man would begin to approach her from the other side. And he didn't always look the same. Sometimes he was older or younger. He was clean shaven or he had facial hair, but she always recognized him and she knew that when they met, something really bad would happen. And one night when she had this dream, which she had a couple times a month, they actually came face to face for the first time. And she said to him, what is your name? And he said, my name is Sammy. And she woke up and she was so afraid that she could not go back to sleep. And so she went to her sister's bedroom and she said, I just had a really bad dream and I don't want to sleep by myself. Can I get in bed with you? And her sister said, what is it? Is it Sammy? And she said, how do you know Sammy? And her sister said, I don't know Sammy. You just brought him in the room with you. And so she turned on the light, and her sister was asleep. So she woke up, and she said, what did you say to me? And her sister said, I didn't say anything to you. I was asleep. <laughs> um, but she never had that dream again. After I got told that story, I was staying at a friend's house on an air mattress in their basement uh, with, a, with French windows sort of to the side and I lay on my back like this, stared at the ceiling until a friend called because she'd had a piece of really good news and she knew I was still awake so she called and she was also uh, away from home staying by herself in a big empty house and after she told me her good news I said, can I tell you a story? <laughs> So I told her the story, and then I went right to sleep, and she stayed awake all night. <laughs> so if tonight you find yourself thinking about that story, my advice is tell somebody else. <laughs> Thank you.